So uh, my name is Leila Khodeida. Uh, what brought me to Nebraska is uh, we didn't actually start with Nebraska when we were first resettled in the U.S. Uh, my family was resettled in Maryland. We spent about nine months to a year in Maryland. We had a very unfortunate experience in Maryland because of the culture shock. We didn't speak uh, the language. And it was very difficult. Um, my, my dad found out that he had a friend in Minnesota and uh, he connected with him and from there we were able to uh, move to Minnesota. We lived in Minnesota in, uh, in Moorhead on the Fargo Moorhead border of uh, North Dakota. We lived there for about I want to say four or five years and then we found out that there were Yazidis here who had lived in the same refugee camps uh, where I had uh, grown up. We lived in refugee camps in Syria for about, for nearly a decade. So w when we found out that there was uh, a few families here who had lived in the same refugee camp, we immediately wanted to be here with them. And then we moved to Lincoln and uh, we've been here for about, I want to say 10 years. 10, 12 years now in Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> when we first came to Nebraska, I noticed it was cold, but it wasn't as cold as Minnesota. <laughs> so um, it was a little bit nicer, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the thing that made me uh, first aware. The first thing that made me aware was these families that had lived in the same refugee camps were actually living here in Lincoln. And um, I didn't want to be anywhere else because for the longest time, um, we were away from the Yazidis and the Yazidi community. We, we, uh, we had been thrown into this society where um, everything was just so difficult. We didn't understand the culture. We didn't understand the language. And so coming here and connecting with those same families from back home was uh, the biggest thing for me. So the Yazidi Cultural Center was established uh, in 2017. Originally when the genocide happened back in August of 2014, the Yazidi Cultural Center was not even a thing because our focus was on, the, um, on what was happening back home. Uh, we had people who had been trapped on Mount Sinjar for days. Uh, the entire Yazidi community had been displaced. And uh, our main focus was to try to get them uh, some support and relief. And then um, two years later, we, we saw a need to help the community here in the U.S. Um, because at the time, there had been more and more Yazidis resettling in the U.S. and mainly in Lincoln because we already have um, a somewhat established community here. So people wanted to come and uh, be with a community that they felt um, familiar with. So when the community grew, we, we saw a need here for people to uh, preserve our culture, our language, and our identity because that was something that was always um, uh, that was something we always fought for back home. It's something that we, we had to always fight for uh, because of um, the persecutions and the long history of wars um, and the most recent genocide encouraged us to even more um, try to establish ourselves here in Lincoln. And because Lincoln is where the largest population of Yazidis is, it made sense to have a center here to address some of the needs um, in terms of preserving the Kurmanji language, the, the culture, and also providing um, uh, services for self-sufficiency um, to uh, learn about their rights here as American residents and eventually becoming citizens, the English language classes, citizenship classes. So different programs that we serve here the, um, at the Yazidi Cultural Center, they can, they can walk into the center and um, receive uh, support with anything that they need. Sometimes people walk in here and they just want somebody to read their letters. Um, sometimes they come here because they want to uh, book their plane tickets. So just anything. Um, that's a very good question. I don't remember and because they didn't really keep track of our 
our um, records. My parents had to flee the war in, in Iraq, and my father actually left my, my mother back home in Iraq until he was able to find um, his, some of his friends were actually um, the ones who informed him of this refugee camp that existed in, in Al Hol, which is now occupied by ISIS. Um, when my mother and my two oldest uh, siblings came to join my father in Syria, we came to the refugee camps. And uh, we lived there for nearly um, a decade. I think it was about eight or nine years. Um, the experience as a, as a child, the, the things that I remember aren't actually really um, horrible because I, I, as a child, it, uh, it was more important for me to go hang out with my friends and um, create our own um, toys made out of mud and um, sticks. And uh, sleeping on the roof is something that I will always remember because um, I would watch the stars and the moon while falling asleep. And these are some of the good memories I had. I also remember uh, some of the unfortunate things that happened in the refugee camps. Um, there were camps that would burn down. I remember two of our neighbors actually died. Um, and they were two very young, um, beautiful girls that, um, that burned because, uh, they, they died because their, their tent burned down. And then also um, many times we didn't have much to, to eat. And I remember my parents talking about these adult things uh, for example, what were, we were going to have the next day and how the bread that we would usually get from the bakery was filled with bugs. And I remember um, I imagined these bugs entering my stomach and <laughs> trying to eat, eat my stomach. So these are some of the things I remember. And then um, the school was about 45 minutes away, so we had to walk very long distance to get to the school because it wasn't inside the camp complex. Sometimes they provided buses, but other times they didn't. And um, we, when, when we walked to the school, um, it was usually very hot and dry. Um, and um, the schools, we, we uh, were sometimes, uh, the, the teachers weren't very nice. I'm not saying all of them weren't very nice, but uh, a lot of the times um, when I compare the schools here to what I experienced um, in the schools in, in Syria is uh, you have more freedom to speak your mind because you're not afraid of your teacher. But, um, but over there, I was, I was afraid to speak my mind. And uh, I remember one time we, we had a a class to, to learn the Quran, uh, which we shouldn't, we sh shouldn't have. <laughs> we should have had the right to say, no, we don't want to. But um, sometimes we had to sit there and uh, sit through the class. And I remember one time I told the teacher that I, I don't want to stay here. Um, he came up to me and he just slapped me across my face. And then he told me to get out of the class. But um, when I look back at those experiences, it, it makes me feel proud that I actually did something very simple, but it makes me feel, feel good about that decision that I made. Um, so through the Yazidi Cultural Center, we, we were providing uh, Kurmanji classes. We had an instructor here who was um, teaching uh, the Yazidi children the alphabets and uh, the different words and um, sentences in the Kormanji language. In general, we don't have a curriculum. We don't have a way of preserving our language. I think it, it's uh, mainly up to the families to pre preserve their, their language. For example, in my family, uh, because both of my parents are still living, they don't speak English at home. So we are forced to speak our own language. And the children, their grandkids in the home, of course, um, they have to speak with their grandparents in their language, and that's how come they're able to still speak uh, in the Kormanji language. And um, the same goes for most of the community here. We don't have um, we don't have a way of keeping the language unless we bring in more efforts to create a curriculum and to um, 
to get more funding to continue to teach through these classes the, the Kormanji language. And it's, when, when you talk about the language, it's not just the language. It, um, it includes your culture. It includes the holidays that you're celebrating. It includes um, the traditions and the rituals. It includes all of these things, and that that makes up uh, uh, your identity and uh, uh, your identity as a Yazidi person. It's not just the language; it's all of these other things that are combined. We've had a very successful advocacy um, group mm -hmm. because uh, because of that advocacy work that we've done over the past uh, five years. I believe that's the reason why uh, the world is more aware of who Yazidis are. Uh, most of the countries around the world have recognized the Yazidi genocide. It's because we made efforts to make that happen through um, Nadia's um, initiative, which was founded uh, by, by our advocacy group, uh, and Yazda and Nadia uh, are um, a big part of why uh, the world now recognizes Yazidis and uh, the Yazidi genocide. So um, locally, we've also gone out to speak at the different churches, different um, universities, and uh, the high schools. We have um, after-school programs for Yazidi youth at the different high schools. So uh, we are making efforts to, to continue to do that, but I think it will take um, the younger Yazidi generation to keep that going and to um, make that um, make those efforts even a stronger stronger goal for them because um, essentially for them and for the Yazidi community to survive we we would need to teach our um, the younger generation that you know th this happened but we have a way of preventing it in the future and um, I would like to see the community follow the the Jewish uh, people's, the Jewish community's example of uh, coming out of their genocide successfully and educating um, our, our younger generation and um, encouraging them to, uh, to continue with their education and to become advocates for their community. So the Yazidi community has, um, especially after the genocide, they are, um, they are now everywhere. Yeah. We have Yazidis in, uh, in Australia. We have a Yazidi community in Canada. We have um, a community here in the US and uh, the second largest community to, um, is, is actually in Europe. Right. Next to Iraq, the second largest one is in Europe. And so uh, because um, even though now we're spread around the world, we still have uh, those strong connections because we are still a small community. Uh, we, we are about a million worldwide. And um, people have those um, connections with each other. And um, we also have, through, through Yazda, we also have our teams around the world. Uh, we have three centers in Iraq, one in Sinjar, one in Baghdad, and then one in the Kurdistan region. Um, we have teams in Australia, Canada, we have advocates in Canada, and then um, Europe, the UK and Germany and Sweden. And this is how we are able to maintain that, the, that relationship and uh, try to collaborate when we're making efforts to help the Yazidi community. Yes, yeah. yes, but uh, wherever they're at, they will have also learned the language of that country. So, so like in Europe, they either speak um, German, uh, most of them speak English. Um, same thing with Canada and Australia. But um, when we communicate with, we, with each other, it's usually in the Comanche language. Um, I would hope that I think the only way we can keep the Yazidi identity is if we don't abandon the, our homeland. Uh, I know people are desperate to get out of uh, the Middle East because of their situation, and I don't blame them. I, I would uh, want the same thing for myself if I was in their situation. But I think for the older generation, um, some of them want to go back home. Some of them have already returned to Sinjar and they would like to see, 
see Sinjar um, uh, be re rebuilt. Uh, they would like it to, to, to see it free of uh, persecution and genocide. They would, they would like it to be uh, protected by the Yazidis themselves so that, um, so that in the future they, they have a, a, a group or those responsible for protecting them, that they have a trust in those people, that they will not be abandoned again. So um, you, have, you have different generations within the community that need different things. So for example, the younger generation, um, their goal is to someday um, go abroad and study, for example, have uh, more opportunities to better their futures. And they know that if they go back to Sinjar, especially at this point, they will not um, have a future for themselves. But um, like I said, for, for the, the older generation, for example, people my dad's age, I think they would want to go back to Sinjar and um, take care of their tobacco fields like they used to. And it's something that was very important for them. My parents talk about it even now. They, their dream is to go back home someday and uh, take care of the tobacco field. <laughs> and. Um, live life the way it used to be, a simple, innocent way of living. Absolutely. We already have casualties in Sinjar. There was a Yazidi uh, house that was uh, um, actually targeted by the Turkish um, airstrikes in Khanasur. And um, it's very concerning for the community because, again, we have thousands and thousands of people who have returned to live in Sinjar. And um, I think we were, we were anticipating something like this to happen when, um, when the Turkish uh, military entered Syria, because we are right on the border of Syria, um, right next to Haseke. And uh, when, when that happened, um, I remember my dad calling his sister, who is now in Sinjar, and asking about the situation there. And they're, um, they're very concerned about their safety. Um, I haven't been confronted a whole lot, but I, I am an advocate for, uh, for refugees because I was a refugee at some point myself. And I know that uh, uh, millions of refugees are uh, living in, in um, very poor conditions. And I think if they had the opportunities, the kind of opportunities that we have here, I think they would better our communities here. They would better this country because they come with a lot of, um, a lot of experience, a lot of uh, knowledge. And um, I would like to see people supporting, especially those uh, who have come from the war zones, I think, uh, when, when we help them, they only um, add better things to our lives here. So just as a, as a person, I've always been passionate about helping my community. Even before 2014, even before the genocide happened, I've always uh, had a vision of uh, somehow um, helping my community. And uh, when the genocide happened, I, I felt obligated because um, that was uh, just from my experience of living in refugee camps and uh, just hearing my parents talk about our long history of, uh, of being persecuted by, by our neighbors and by uh, the governments. It was just um, to see the center finally become something possible was, uh, was a, a, a big goal for me. Um, I remember one time I was sitting at work just uh, researching grants and I came across uh, a grant and uh, I was like, you know, let's apply for this grant and see where, where it goes. So I reached out to Max Graves, who is the um, executive director of uh, the Center for Legal Immigration. And uh, we agreed to apply for this grant. And um, when it got approved, it was the, the greatest news for me because I, I, felt, I felt like I had accomplished something. So. Um, it has affected me on a personal level when I see that uh, there is a center that serves my own community. And it's not just my own community. It's uh, anybody that walks into the center. We, uh, we, know, we don't deny services to anyone. But it has 
always been my dream to see something um, like this happen for my own community. Um, and it's among uh, hundreds of other um, organizations and centers for other communities. So to be able to see that, um, that something is there for, for the community is, is a big, big, uh, big deal for me. Um, I would hope to see the community grow um, or the, the center to grow into something bigger, something that serves uh, the community in different ways, not just their basic needs. I would like to see the center to become like a, a temple someday where people can uh, come here for their religious um, celebrations and uh, attend their holiday events and uh, to have scholars come in, uh, you know, um, to hold large conferences for people to, to come to the center and talk about the Yazidi history and genocide and uh, just a much, I have a bigger vision for the center and I, uh, we are looking and working uh, for that to happen someday. Um, so there is uh, different groups in the community. You have the group who was resettled back in the 1990s, and then you have the group um, that is currently still coming in as, uh, so the first group was mainly refugees who came from Syria. And then you have um, the, the second wave of immigrants is mainly, uh, is mainly the uh, interpreters who come with special visas. The situation was different for each group when they were first resettled. Um, for, for my family and the group that came during that time from Syria, it was much more difficult because our parents did not speak the language. We were not aware of uh, the culture here. It was a, a, we, had, we went through a major cultural shock um, and then our, the younger kids um, kind of forgot their language because they immediately when, uh, were entered into schools and they went to school full time. So there is that generational gap between the parents and the younger children. And then you have the, the other group that, that came with special visas. They already speak the language and they are aware of the culture here because of their experience with working with the US military. So when they come here, they're kind of at a better place than we were. And um, I would like to see them use their language and their experience in a way that will help their community uh, grow and be successful. And I think um, to prevent some of the issues that take place in the community. Um, for example, we have uh, younger kids who are involved in the juvenile justice system. I would like to see more Yazidis become educated about those things and what kinds of things will get them into trouble. Just becoming familiar with the legal system here, I think will prevent some of the, the issues that we see. So Yazda was established in 2014 following the genocide immediately. It was in response to the genocide actually. We, um, so in August of 2014, I, I still had a brother who was living in Iraq and uh, it's, it wasn't just my brother. I have um, extended family members, my aunts and uncles still living in Iraq and it wasn't just them, it was the entire Yazidi community that had been targeted for genocide by ISIS. So um, when, when that happened, we uh, formed a group and it was the entire Yazidi community that, um, that helped during that time because uh, we were in the state of shock and disbelief. And the news that was coming from Iraq was, was unbelievable. And uh, we knew that it had happened in the past. And this was just uh, another genocide that was gonna take place. But now we have social media to, um, to create that awareness about what was happening in the community. So um, the Yazda was created in August, actually, of 2014, immediately following the genocide because uh, we were meeting with um, the U.S. State Department and many different representatives in the, in the government 
that had wanted to follow up with people who had gone there to advocate for their community. And it wasn't just the, the Yazda group. Again, it was the entire Yazidi community. And we had hundreds of Yazidis standing um, in front of the White House. And uh, we were holding a peaceful demonstration. So um, the, the efforts kind of continued. And uh, some people actually lost their jobs because we were in D.C. for, uh, for a long period of time. For, for many, it was uh, a week, and uh, a week was long enough for them to lose their jobs. So um, again, going back to your question, you, you wanted to know how the efforts as, or myself as a social worker, yeah. how that took place. Um, I, I would join any efforts that would help my community, but at the time, it wasn't just me. It was like the entire community felt obligated to do something. Um, and uh, it was uh, just coming back. We knew that we couldn't stop there. So I continued to, to join the Yazda group to, um, to continue our efforts to help the community. I come from a... Um, a country where women don't have a, a, a lot of rights, but I think it depends on each family. And I feel like in the Yazidi community, I feel like there is more acceptance of change mm -hmm. and uh, people are have uh, more freedom, especially women. Mm -hmm. I feel like they, they do have more freedom compared with um, some of the other women that I've seen come from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, we already see women driving, uh, learning, the language uh, and uh, pursuing their education and um, being part of this community that they were never exposed to before when they were living in Sinjar. Mm -hmm. So um, I think most Yazidi men are proud to see the women succeed and become leaders in their community. Mm -hmm. uh, we have many survivors who were captured by ISIS and uh, after they escaped, um, a lot of the Yazidi men are very supportive of them. Uh, the large majority of the community is supportive of these survivors, mm -hmm. and they encourage them to, uh, to go on and continue their advocacy work. Um, they've gotten married to Yazidi men. Um, they've been accepted back in the community. But again, it, it, it depends on each family of how, how they uh, perceive that. So. But for the, uh, for the most part, I think they, they, they would like to see their women succeed and become leaders. And they, um, they encourage them to, to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm actually surprised at how well ahead a lot of the, uh, especially the women are. They, they come here um, as soon as they get resettled. They are very motivated to uh, to continue their education, and it's something I I am uh, pleasantly um, surprised because um, well I'm not I shouldn't say I'm surprised I think if they had the opportunity to to do that back home they would so they come and they're very hungry for for education and for uh, becoming successful mm -hmm. and um, that that's something that I feel like will only better the community. Um, is, is that different? So that's different than how you experienced it? People, like the younger when, generation is more ready to embark on yes. education? Yes. So the younger generation, um, especially with the new arrivals, and I shouldn't say new because they've almost been here five years now, mm -hmm. but they are a more, they seem more ready to, um, to start their lives here. Mm -hmm. Because when we first resettled, I remember I was depressed because I was, taken away from my community and um, it was just uh, very, very depressing times for me and I think that would have been the case for a lot of the, um, the people that had been resettled back in the 1990s because mm -hmm. um, again of uh, the, the, the men in the household did not speak the language and they, there was no way for them to, uh, to be able to lead the house the household in, in this new community, in this new country. So we were not as prepared. So um, 
it, it's I feel like it's easier for the new new gener or not just the new generation but the new group of people that um, that have been resettled I feel like they're more ready to just uh, start their lives in this new country I actually learned my most of my English in Minnesota because um, there were no Yazidis living there uh, so when I went to school, I only spoke English, and uh, when I came back home, I would speak in English with my siblings, but with my parents, it was my native language. And I think during those five years is when I learned most of the English language. So when, when we actually came here um, to join the rest of the Yazidi community here in Lincoln, I was, um, I had already, uh, I, I don't want to say perfect, but I had already, um, learned the, the English language in a way that was the, where I was able to, to get by very well. When you compare Lincoln, when I compare Lincoln to other places, I feel like Lincoln is a very diverse um, city. You have, uh, you have Yazidis, you have Kurds, you have Muslims and um, Mexicans and Asians. You have people from all different uh, ethnicities and backgrounds here, right here in Lincoln. So uh, for the most part, I think they're welcomed by the Lincoln community. Um, but that's not to say that you, you don't come across situations where people are, where people come off as racist. And I've experienced that myself when I've uh, taken my mother, for example, to Walmart. Mm -hmm. One time we walked by uh, this older lady who was in a wheelchair and I was um, speaking to my mother in our native language and we walked by this older lady and she, she turned around and uh, was, uh, was like, um, you should speak uh, English because this is uh, America. <laughs> and so that was... Uh, what did you say to her? Did you say anything? At the time I ignored it, mm. but it happened again one time when we were inside <laughs> Super Saver. <laughs> The, ca the cashier person was uh, saying some things that were um, was disturbing for me and uh, for my son and my nephew to hear because he said, we take all these immigrants for granted when they come to our country. And uh, I just kind of went off on him. <laughs> and I said, uh, you, you have no idea what we've been through. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, this was actually after the genocide happened. And uh, so... I was uh, just um, very, it was very sad to, to see him say something like that because mm -hmm. I, I, um, I felt sorry for him because I was like um, thinking if this person had gone through the same experience that we did to try to, um, to survive all mm -hmm. those years and to be able to make it here and to be good citizens, I think we are good citizens for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at this person as being very sheltered and not understanding what is happening outside of his comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So um, I just uh, looked at him and I said, I, I feel sorry for, for you because you don't know what, um, what, and I pointed to my mom, what she has been, gone, what she has gone through um, and that her people are actually facing genocide as you make these racist comments. And, um, he didn't seem to want to accept that. He didn't. <laughs> he just kind of wanted to get our groceries and be done with it. And I think that happened because my mother tr dresses differently. She still dresses in her traditional clothes, and I've noticed that when when I'm with her, um, and it doesn't always happen. Sometimes people love the way she's dressed, but other times, and um, it's usually more people. Um, uh, being uh, kind of welcoming that that difference in the dress code, but sometimes it happens where people don't appreciate it because they generalize things and they think she's um, she they don't know who Yazidis are, so they kind of uh, think of this person as being Muslim because she's wearing a scarf and she has a long dress on. So I think educating people is important, especially when you hear those kinds of comments. Uh, I would like to uh, see less of that happen, not just for my community, but for, for any refugees that come here.
Because I've gone to just... Germany a few times. I don't, uh, I don't go to meet with uh, the refugees there. It's just to go see my family. But I did go back to Iraq, and I went on the to visit the people who had um, gone back to live in Sinjar, mm -hmm. and then also um, to see some of our project on the ground. And I think that was a good experience to see because when you go and you see the product mm -hmm. of uh, your work, you are kind of encouraged to continue because you know that there are thousands of people depending on, on the work, the kind of simple things that you're doing here. Can you give us an example of the projects that you're talking so about? So when I was there at the time, uh, we had, we had um, smaller projects. We, uh, we started with a psychosocial support program to help the survivors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there in, in our center when uh, the survivors would come and uh, our documentation team would interview them and take their testimonies. And uh, it was very depressing to see what they had gone through. Um, and then other times uh, there were children coming into the center and uh, just uh, wanting uh, their basic needs. Uh, when I was there, when we visited Sinjar, we um, distributed chickens, <laughs> and uh, it was a it was a different thing. But I think uh, for for those families who had been living in Sinjar, that was uh, that was that was very helpful for them because it baby chickens. I mean little chickens. We had like thousands of chickens that we distributed to the families there. Um, and they, they could benefit from these chickens um, by getting eggs from them and by having meals from these chickens. And uh, it was very, I was just very um, heartwarming to see these children run towards you and um, take their chickens home. <laughs> that was just a, a very small project compared to what we do now because now we, um, we have grants that help with um, um, we have funds that help with small businesses in the Sinjar region and uh, many, many other uh, ways of helping the community there. Oh my God. Um, I think, I, I don't know what other people have told you, but I think it's... It's, it's, uh, not, it's a range that yes. we're not going to yes. change and there is a way to change. Yes. So. Well, I think if we say we're not going to change, we're going to face very many challenges mm -hmm. because we've already seen it in the community. Um, this is an issue that, um, that affects almost every, commun every family, actually, especially those who have been here for um, a long time. They, so the children have developed relationships with non-Yazidis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the heads of the household need to be more educated about that. They cannot be strict with their children. They have to be more flexible. Um, I would say for the most part, Yazidis are flex flexible when it comes to different things. But when it comes to intermarrying, um, uh, that still not has been uh, very well accepted in the community. I think the idea is to try to um, keep the Yazidi identity as pure as possible, but that is that's not possible. <laughs> we we have seen it. It's not going to continue this way. I think uh, mm -hmm. it, we have to be smart about how we deal with this issue because uh, we are we have women in the community who have um, who have um, left the community to to um, to basically fulfill their personal needs rather than to. Um, make the community happy. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I look at that, that's, that's a loss because we have lost another person. Mm -hmm. And if we could accept those people back in the community, I think uh, whether we like it or not, it's going to continue to happen. So we need to find a way to handle those kinds of situations in a way where, where both sides are happy. Mm -hmm. You're still being part of your community and you're still helping the community grow and uh, you're still preserving your language, but you're also fulfilling your personal needs outside of the community. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just an issue that, uh, that is not discussed in the community, but it's something that happens. Mm -hmm. And I, I just feel like um, it's going to affect more and more people 
in the community. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, uh, if it's not addressed, I think it will be, it will be a big challenge in the future. So let's let's look at the example of the survivors right. who um, who come back with um, who actually make that risk to um, to escape mm -hmm. from ISIS captivity. They come back into the community, and there was this um, this uh, commotion, I want to call it, that happened where. Um, Half of the community was against these women to bring back their kids who were born out of rape, and the other half was uh, was accepting of uh, their decision to bring up to bring back their children with them. Mm -hmm. So you have different opinions in the community, even when it comes to situations that happen here locally, where um, where people make decisions that are not very well um, approved mm -hmm. by the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. And when I say the rest of the community. Um, I, I had, I had a few friends, um, and I was for the decision of these women to come back and, uh, mm -hmm. and to, to be free and what they decide to do with their children who were born out of rape. But then I also had friends who did not want to have anything to do with that conversation because their idea and the way they looked at the situation was that this woman's brothers were killed by ISIS, their fathers were killed by ISIS, their homes were destroyed by ISIS. These children are going to grow up um, supporting ISIS ideology someday. And I can understand their point of view, but um, just like that, there's other situations that happen here locally where we kind of have a difference in opinion. Mm -hmm. So you, you have people who look at it both ways. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do agree that uh, when it comes to the situations here, that um, people who have been here long enough to see that those things are going to happen inevitably, is uh, they seem to accept it more than those who haven't seen that, who haven't gone through that experience. Mm -hmm. And um, I would, I don't know, I would just like to, um, I've been through that experience, the process, and I've seen it in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, even my own family was very strict in the beginning but now they, they see it happening and they have no control over it. So the community needs to come up with a way to, to deal with it and to handle those kind of situations. It all comes down to a personal decision. You either, um, you either choose what you want to do with your personal life or um, there is not a formal way of going about, about that. Yes, we have the spiritual council um, that, kind of, that kind of makes decisions when it comes to um, major issues within the Yazidi religion. But I think, um, <clears throat> I think that when, when you have been away from your homeland for so long that you don't, um, those, the decisions they make kind of don't align with your lifestyle abroad. So... <laughs> So the decisions that, that are made by the spiritual council um, is important, but it doesn't uh, really apply to the lifestyle outside of Iraq for, for many reasons. So we do have a spiritual council that makes decisions, those bigger decisions that are related to the Yazidi religion. But um, I, I personally don't see it as being very effective. I would like to see it, to see the spiritual council be more involved in, in their community and their community's need and to be educated about what is happening with their community outside of Iraq so that they are able to address the needs of the Yazidi community as a whole because um, we still depend on that spiritual council to, to lead us, but we want them to lead us in a way that will make the community more successful. Um, so the Yazidis, the way I describe them is that they are a very small minority that uh, originates uh, from the Middle East. 
they have a long persecution of, uh, of uh, the long history of persecutions and, and wars. Um, I think for the most part, Yazidi community is a very peaceful community. We have never um, declared war against um, any, any other community surrounding us in, in, in our homeland. Um, I, we don't have the kind of power to, to, uh, to declare war against any other communities. But I think for the most part, um, Yazidis are known as victims of genocide. So when, when you, I bet you, if you research um, genocide, Yazidis will come up on, on your list as a people who have suffered from multiple genocides in their history. And um, we have a very beautiful culture. We have uh, a beautiful language. And um, we have different holidays that we celebrate. We have a holiday in spring that we celebrate, which is the renewal of, of Earth. And we celebrate the we celebrate that exact thing. Um, the Yazidis are not even supposed to have uh, weddings in the month of April because we feel that that month is uh, a month of the renewal of Earth, and nothing is more beautiful than that. Um, and then we have another holiday which is coming up here in December, which is the winter holiday where Yazidis fast for three days and. Uh, and then um, the fourth day, is, uh, we, we hold um, a celebration. So um, back in our homeland, these all were uh, holidays and traditions that, that were practiced uh, with uh, very details, where uh, the Qawals would come from the Lalish uh, temple, and they would visit the villages. But that doesn't... Uh, that hasn't been happening recently because of the genocide. So we have many, many beautiful things about the Yazidi religion, the Yazidi culture, and um, again, the primary language spoken by Yazidis is the Kurmanji, but we also have Yazidis and Bashika and Ba'zani who uh, speak Arabic because of where they grew up. Um, let's see, what else about the Yazidis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, football is a big deal here. <laughs> um, I think back home, soccer is uh, a popular sport, but here it's football. And um, I remember just uh, a few weekends ago, I was uh, driving with my mother, and uh, there were groups of people crossing the street, and they were all dressed in red. And my mother was um, questioning what that was about. And the way I explained it to her is, do you remember when people made the pilgrimage to Lalish and how important that was for people? <laughs> this is that same kind of thing for uh, the Lincoln uh, citizens. When, when, when football season comes around, it's like making that pilgrimage <laughs> to Lalish. For them, it's, uh, it's a very big uh, event that happens. So, okay. yeah. And I love how people are just crazy about it. <laughs>